And everybody said, yeah. ah, you can do better than that. Everybody said, yeah. the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. And the Lord help us so that all the training we're receiving and all this development will make an impact in every life. And the work of God will prosper in our hands. In your, in your hands in particular, the work will prosper in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for our development of the leadership tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you open the scriptures to everyone. And we're asking that your word will impact every life, even tonight, in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you'll teach us something. Reveal something, impart something that will know that definitely this is what we'll learn today. And we pray, Lord, that it will be written indelibly in every heart, and we will live according to your word, labor according to your word, and we'll be fruitful in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church said, God bless you, you can see now. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. As you look at the bracket there in the parenthesis, it says, In the volume of the book, it's written concerning me that's the lord jesus christ saying that the word from the beginning of the old testament to the end of the old testament and then as you come to the new testament in the volume of the books it is written concerning me lo behold i come to do thy will O god look at verse 9 then said he lo i come to do thy will, O God. I come to do thy will, O God. We need to understand concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that from the time he came to this world, he knew the will of the Father for him. He knew why he came to the world and he was going to do just one thing, only one thing. He was going to commit himself he was going to surrender himself. He was going to addict himself. He was going to totally be surrendered to just one thing, and that is doing the will of God. Did we say that from the beginning that he came into this world, that is what he knew? Let's go back before the beginning, from the foundation of the world. Let's go back before the foundation of the world. He knew that this is what he was going to do. And we're looking at First Peter chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 18. First Peter chapter 1. We're reading from verse 18. In verse 18, it tells us, it says for us, much as ye know, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold uh, from your conversation that uh, you had or you received from your tradition from your fathers. It says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, that's a sacrifice. That's the crucifixion. That's when he went to Calvary. But look at this now in verse 20. Who verily was foreordained. It says before the foundation of the world. But was manifest in these last times for you. It tells us that the crucifixion. It tells us that the sacrifice. The shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ had been put in place before the foundation of the world. He knew that. And so because he knew that, as he came into this world, he knew there was just one thing to do, to be committed to the will of the Father. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 1. I will read him from verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 4, still emphasizing the same thing, it tells us in verse 4, it says, according to, 
according as he has chosen us he says in him before the foundation of the world he knew what he was going to do from the foundation of the world even before the foundation of the world and he says that we shall be holy and without blame before him in love it's been decided by God the Father and God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ had agreed even before that foundation of the world that this was going to happen. That's why we we'll come back to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 10. That's why he could say all the things that were reaching. You remember from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 reaching concerning him. You remember Exodus when I said the blood I'll pass over you is what as we're reaching concerning him. You remember Leviticus when it says the atonement is the life, the blood in the life is the atonement for the sins of the people. It's reaching concerning him. When it says the serpent was lifted up in numbers, reaching concerning him, he knew the will of God and he knew that before the world began all these have been decided and now he comes to Hebrews and then he tells us in chapter 10 and in verse 7 then said I lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O God then said he verse 9 lo I come to do thy will O God it was committed to doing the will of God Consecrated to do the will of God, surrender to do the will of God, absolutely submissive to doing the will of God. And then we understand when he came to this world early in his life, when it was just about the age of 12, he was telling the mother, Mary, why are you searching for me? Wish you not, didn't you know I must be by my, by my father's business? We're looking at Luke. In Luke chapter 2, he told the mother, and we need to remind ourselves that this is what he knew he was going to do. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. In verse 49, and he said unto them, the mother and Joseph and the rest of them, how is it that he sought me? Was she not? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Just one thing to do. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's the one that shed his blood and he gave himself for us, doing the will of God. But you understand, if you're a believer, if you, you understand, if you're a child of God, that we're to follow after Christ, we're to have the mind of Christ as he was committed to the will of the Father, to the will of God. And he said, that's the only thing to do. And was to do that always. He was to do that ever. He was to do that wholeheartedly. He was to do that daily. He was to do that perpetually. He was to do that cheerfully. He was to do that willingly. He was to do that single-mindedly. Doing the will of God. The same thing for us. If there is anything we're going to do, if there's anything we're living for, we're living for the will of God. And we wake up in the morning, we say, praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll be glad and rejoice in it because I'm going to do the will of God today. I'm going to do the will of God always. I'm going to do only the will of God. I'm going to do the will of God wholeheartedly. I'm going to do the will of God willingly. Why? Because we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. We are to be like Christ who came to do the will of God and said, Lo, it is written of me in the volume of the books, I come to do thy will, O God. Come to Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 29 talking about the christian talking about the believer and talking about what we ought to be how we ought to position ourselves and how we ought to do the will of god being conformed unto christ it says for whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son to be conformed to the image of his son did he do the will of God? So must we. Was he yielded to the Lord? So must we. Was he abandoned to do the will of God? So must we. And was he so committed, consecrated that 
only, always, ever. It was the will of God. He did so must we. He says we are to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And let's come to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. He did the will of God. We must do the will of God. He was abandoned to the will of God. We must be abandoned to the will of God as well. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. What was the mind of Christ? I come to do the will of God. I'm only to do the will of God. I'm committed to do the will of God. And I do that only the will of God. And I do that always the will of God. And I do that ever the will of God. It says, let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're coming to 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 21. It tells us, for even hereunto were ye called, even hereunto were ye called. Are you born again? This is your calling. Do you have eternal life? This is your calling. Are you a child of God? This is your calling. For even here unto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us. That's the will of God for him. To go to Calvary suffered for us. To be betrayed suffered for us. To be crucified suffered for us. And to die on that cross suffered for us. To be taken down, buried suffered for us. That's what he came to do. That's why he came. If he healed the sick, didn't get to the cross, he had not fulfilled the will of God. If he opened the eyes of the blind, if he worked out those miracles, if he multiplied the bread and gave to those thousands of people without getting to the cross, he had not fulfilled the will of God. The ultimate, the finality, the centrality of the will of God for him was to suffer for us. And he said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written concerning me to do thy will, O God. Look at verse 21. For even here unto are ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that everybody, one, two, three, go. Everybody, one, two, three, go. Let me hear your voice. Are you not leaders? Everybody, one, two, three, go. That he should follow his steps. That's telling us then he did the will of God, follow his steps. He did only the will of God, follow his steps. He did always the will of God, follow his steps. He did daily the will of God, follow his steps. We are coming to First John chapter 2, verse 6. First John chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 6. It's telling us here, a Christian, and he is Christ. The Christian must be like Christ. You're saved, you'll be like the Savior. You're sanctified, you'll be like the sanctifier. It tells us in First John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, He that says he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. He that says he abideth in Christ, I'm a child of God, I'm born again, I'm following the Lord, then you must do the will of God because that's exactly what he did. We're looking at chapter 3, verse 3. In chapter 3, verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. We're to be like Christ. He did the will of God. You will do the will of God. Somebody there said you will do the will of God. And he fulfilled the totality of the will of God for him. You must fulfill the totality of the will of God for you. First John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 17. First John chapter 4, reading from verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. He'll perfect your love. Your love for God, your love for his word, your love for his work. He'll perfect that love in Jesus' name. It says here in is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, look at this, because, see this very well, because, tell me out aloud, praise the Lord, 
as he is so are we in this world and what he did you he did the will of god he performed the will of god he fulfilled the will of god and as he is so are we in this world first corinthians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 16 first corinthians chapter 2 and we're reading here from verse 16 it says in verse 16 first corinthians chapter 2 it says for who has known the mind of the lord that he may instruct him look at the last sentence there but we have the mind of christ we have the mind of Christ. We're born again. We have the mind of Christ. We possess eternal life. We have the mind of Christ. We're new creatures in Christ. We have the mind of Christ. He did the will of God. That's his mind. That's his mind. And he did always, he did ever, he did only the will of God. And we have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to do the will of God. Tonight, we're looking at the word of God concerning uh, the subject, our unwavering unwavering commitment to fulfilling God's will. Our unwavering commitment to fulfilling God's will. He wants us to be unwavering. He wants us to be steadfast. He wants us to be determined. He wants us to be absolutely surrendered unto him so that the only thing that matters to us and the only thing we want to do anytime anywhere every time everywhere is doing the will of god and thank god we're going to do the will of god our unwavering commitment to fulfilling god's will three things we're looking at number one steadfast consecration for god's perfect will steadfast determined unwavering steady unchanging, committed, consecration to doing God's will. Steadfast consecration for God's perfect will. We're going to look at Psalm 40. And I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 40. We're reading from verse 8. In Psalm 40 verse 8, here is what the Lord is telling us concerning the will of God and concerning our attitude to that will. Look at Psalm 40 verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Actually, the psalmist writing that said, this was his joy and this was his delight. And this was what he cherished. He said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. And then he said, because, and he says, yea, thy law is within my heart. Because the law is written on the heart, the purpose of that, the reason for that, is so that we can do the will of God and rejoice in it and delight in it. Come to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and see what the Lord is telling us about the law, the word being written in our heart. And if that is done, the purpose, the purpose is, I delight in thy will, O oh my God. I delight to do your will. I delight to know your will. I delight to fulfill your will because the law is written in my heart. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, it's telling us, look at it from verse 14. In verse 14, it says, For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. He sanctifies us. And then he says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, look at verse 16 now, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. 
when we are sanctified that's what he does he writes the law he writes the word he's right he writes his will in our heart and Psalm 40 tells us I delight to do thy will oh my God yea thy law is reaching on my heart and when you come to the Lord today and you experience the efficacy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary he saves you and then he sanctifies you by that offering by that sacrifice when he sanctifies you he writes his word in your heart and that's what it takes so that you know today that once you're sanctified and the word of God is written on your heart it is so that you will delight to do the will of God you will do the will of God I will do the will of God you will do it in Jesus name do you remember the prayer he prayed he told us to pray he taught us to pray we're looking at Matthew chapter 6 Matthew chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 9 and reading from verse 10 Matthew chapter 6 reading from verse 9 it tells us in this uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 after this manner therefore pray ye a father which art in heaven you see your father I said, you see your father, what follows then, hallowed be thy name. You will honor the name of the Lord. Verse 10, thy kingdom come. And once you come into that kingdom, and the power of the kingdom is efficacious in your life, look at this, thy will be done in us as it is done in heaven. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Who are the people that do the will of God in heaven? I said, who are the people that do the will of God in heaven? Tell me out aloud. Angels, the angels of God. Uh, put your finger there in Matthew, but come to Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, we're told about those angels, how they do the will of God. Look at Psalm 103. And we're reading from verse 20. Psalm 103, verse 20. It says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the, unto the, voice of his word that's his will and how do those angels do the will of god first of all let us remind ourselves those angels how they are not how they don't do the will and then we'll say how they do the will they were not they don't do the will of god partially they do the will of god not partially and it says the will be done on earth as it is done in heaven the angels do not do the will of God a kind of um, selectively. Okay, I accept this. I reject this. I accept this. I drop this. They do not seek the will of God. They know that this is the will of God and they do the will of God. They do not do the will of God partially. They do not do the will of God selectively. They do not do the will of God occasionally. Yes, we do the word of God, we do the will of God occasionally. Okay, no, they do the will of God completely every time. And they do not do that will superficially. You see, there are people, they can do something superficially. It's not in depth. It's not in their heart. It's not in their mind. It's not in their bone. It's not in their blood. It's not within them. They do it superficially on the surface, not the angels. And remember, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Those angels do not do the will of God hypocritically. Hypocritically. That, you know, it appears they are doing it, but it's hypocritical. When somebody is there, it's done. And it's done well. And when somebody is not there, it is not done well. And they do not do the will of God seasonally. Ah, it's dry season now. And because it's dry season, I know that this is what I should do, but I'm feeling so hot. 
and I'm feeling so the heat is terrible and the season doesn't allow me to do the will of God the angels don't do the will of God seasonally they do the will of God with all their hearts and they do not do the will of God in such a way that uh, they, they are you know just uh, doing it but they are not realistic about it but they do that will of God how do they do the will of God number one swiftly the moment that thing is given they fly to that location and they get that thing done and there is no delay at all number two they do it sincerely sincerely that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven they do the will of God wholeheartedly all their heart is there all their mind is there all their will is there everything they've got all their strength all their ability all their spiritual quality is there they do the will of God wholeheartedly and they do the will of God promptly promptly the Lord says this now it's done the Lord does not have to repeat it two times three times ten times before they do the will of God when we are doing the will of God the way Christ wants and the way he taught us to pray and he says that will be done in earth as it is done in heaven will be prompt in doing the will of God they do the will of God urgently as if we must do it now we must do it now the Lord has commanded urgently we carry this out they do that will loyally they are loyal servants of the Lord he calls we answer he sends we go he tells us and it is carried out they do the will of God loyally they do the will of God fearlessly fearlessly the Lord has revealed his mind the Lord has revealed his will and those angels will not fear anyone send any of the angels to the most powerful man on earth what have they got to fear they do the will of God fearlessly are you like that because this is what Jesus taught us he said he himself lo in the volume of the book it is written concerning me I come to do thy will oh God and then he points us to the angels and he says we do your will here on earth as it is done in heaven and those angels are fearless in doing the will of God and they do the will of God faithfully they do the will of God fully they do the word of the will of God freely. They don't have to wait for, okay, what are you going to give me, God, if I run the errand? They do it freely without any strings attached to it. And the Lord is teaching us to pray. He's saying, Thy will be done. The will of God will be done in your life. I said, The will of God will be done in your life. He wants us to have steadfast consecration to the perfect will of God and look at what God is looking for we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 13 Acts of the Apostles we're reading from chapter 13 and I'm reading from verse 22 Acts chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 22 it says in verse 22 and when he had removed him removed Saul he raised up unto them David to be king and to be king to whom also he gave testimony look at testimony about David and look at testimony he wants to give about everyone and look at what he wants to say about you and about man about everyone he says over here and said I have found David I pray we'll find you today I said you will find you today I have found David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart tell me which shall fulfill a part of my will the easy part all my will which shall fulfill all my will that's what God delights in that you are converted and you are so converted that your heart is transformed your heart is changed and you are made conformable unto the will of God and the Lord can testify concerning you like he testified about David I have found David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will Romans chapter chapter 12 in Romans chapter 12 reading from verses 1 and 2 Romans chapter 12 Verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
By mercy, he saved us. By mercy, he sanctified us. By mercy, he accepted us. By mercy, he brought us into the kingdom. By mercy, we can now say, Abba, Father. By mercy, he set us free. By mercy, he counts us as one of his children. And he said, because of the manifold mercies of God you have received, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Why? Because the world is not doing the will of God. The world is not committed to the will of God. The world does not even delight in the will of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. That's what he demands. That's what he's looking for in your life. The moment you become a child of God and you're born again, he's confronting you with his will. That here is Christ who has saved you. And that Christ did the will of God all the time, every time, always, ever, only the will of God. And he did that will of God conscientiously. He did that will of God from all the earth. And the moment you are born again, you are coming to the kingdom. The Lord is challenging you. You are saved to be like Christ, your Savior. You are saved so you can be conformed unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he did the will of God, so you will do the will of God in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen there? Psalm 143. Psalm 143. This should be your prayer. This should be your desire. And when you pray this kind of prayer, you pray it with all your heart. You pray it sincerely. You pray it because you want an answer. And you pray because you are going to actually do it. We're looking at Psalm 143. And we're looking at verse 10. Psalm 143. And we're looking at verse 10. It says, teach me to do thy will. Teach me. To do thy will. It's not just that I want to know it. I want to have it in my mind. Have it in my head. Learn it. And be able to quote the verses. Yes, that's important. You must know it. But then you must do it. You must fulfill it. It says, teach me to do thy will. Then it says, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me unto the land of uprightness he wants us to know the will of god and to do the will of god when he saves us he gives us the strength and now when he sanctifies us he also makes us to do that will of god in such a complete manner philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 philippians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 13 it says in verse 13 for it is God which walketh in you. It is God, your creator. It is God, your redeemer. It is God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is God who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. That as you believe in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. And he says, it is that God which walketh in you. Not just, uh, you know, talking to you. He performs the miracle within you. The miracle of conversion. And the miracle of consecration. And the miracle of total surrender unto the Lord. And it says, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You will do it. You will perform it. And the will of God will be number one. The priority of your life in Jesus' name. Hebrews Chapter 13, reading from verse 20, Hebrews. Chapter 13, reading from verse 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, and Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Tell me what follows in verse 21. 
make you perfect, he will do it. Every imperfection, the Lord will take away. If we really want to serve the Lord, if we really want to follow the Lord, if we want not just to be nominal Christians, nominal church goers, if we want not just to be head knowledge Christians, but we want to have the real nature of Christ within us, that's exactly what God will do. Make you perfect in every good work, look at this, to do His will. And he's talking about sanctification here. When he says he'll make you perfect sanctification to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You know, the Adamic nature, the old man hesitates. When the old man hears the word of God, when someone who still carries and is having within him, he is having the old man, the Adamic nature. When that pe fellow hears about the will of God, he hesitates. The old man, the Adamic nature, staggers at the commandment of God, at the requirement to do the will of God. The old man vacillates. I want to, shouldn't I? I will. Can I start now? Maybe I will do it sometimes, but not now. He vacillates because he has the old man. The old man wavers and struggles. He struggles with the will of God. The old man. He cannot go forth immediately when God has declared this is the will of God. And this is what he requires. The old man will delay and hold back. If you find yourself hesitating, staggering at the will of God, you find yourself vacillating, you find yourself wavering and struggling, you find yourself delaying and holding back, that's the old man, that's the old man there. The old man calculates and bargains. When he hears about the will of God, this is the will of God. We're not just talking about the will of God in marriage. The will of God in every area of your life. In your sanctification, because that's the will of God. In your upright life, that's the will of God. In being separated from the world, that's the will of God. In carrying out what he has called you to do, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that's the will of God. In preparing for heaven, that's the will of God. In being conformed unto Christ, that's the will of God. When the old man hears about the will of God, he calculates and he bargains. If I were to do that, what do I get? If I am to do that, what do I gain? If I go into that, what advantage will it be for me? That's the old man. The old man reasons and uh, weighs the options. The old man is, uh, you know, reasoning and weighing the option. If I do this, somebody else will do that. If I do this, somebody else will do that. That's the old man. When you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I want this old man not only crucified, but destroyed, taken out of the way, then sanctification frees you from the old man. I say sanctification frees you from the old man. It frees you from the downward pool of the Adamic nature. That old man, when he's gotten rid of, the sanctification unites you with Christ. As he wanted to do the will of God, so also you want to do the will of God. It is that sanctification that brings you into cheerful agreement with God. God says this, yes, Lord, I agree. I don't know where it will carry me. I don't know what will be the final consequence. But Lord, I agree because the old man is gone. It is the, oh, it is the sanctification that makes you to accept the will of God desire the will of God, do the will of God, perform the will of God, fulfill the will of God. Our will is swallowed up in his will. His word, his way, his will to be done in our lives at any cost, whatever the cost may be. The Lord will do it. Colossians chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 12. It tells us what the prayer 
of the ministers of God should be for the members of the congregation. And if their prayer is like that, they themselves must have the evidence and the experience of wanting to do, desiring to do, delighting to do the will of God. It tells us in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's what he himself, Epaphras, had experienced. And because he had explained that, by the touch, by the transformation, of the Lord Jesus Christ in his spirit, his soul, and his mind. Now he prayed for the Colossian believers. And as he prayed for the Colossian believers, fervently was praying, regularly was praying, and wholeheartedly he was praying, devotedly he was praying for the Colossian believers. And now we also should be praying for ourselves today. This kind of prayer that will be totally yielded and totally committed and totally given and totally absolutely surrendered to the perfect will of God. And after you have prayed for yourself and you have seen the evidence in your life, then you are praying for members of the church, members of your local church, members that you are interacting with, the members that you know. That you, look at that verse 12 again. A preference is one of you. You are one of the people. You are meaning among the people you love the people you cherish the people and you desire the best for the people is servant of Christ you're a servant of Christ and you know that what will please Christ is that the members under your influence the workers under your influence the leaders under your influence they will be like Christ they'll be conformed unto Christ a servant of Christ salutes you always laboring how? Always laboring, I said how? Fervently. You know, if you are laboring haphazardly, you're laboring, you're almost sleeping on the pulpit. You're laboring, but it's dull. You're laboring, it's like there's no interest. You're laboring, it's like somebody is forcing you to do it. You're laboring and you're saying, when will I be excused from doing this? That's not fervent. But it says, laboring fervently for you in prayers, in prayers, in preaching, in exhortation, in instruction, in everything that we do. Look at what he prayed for, that she may be found, that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. The Lord will do it through us. He'll do it through you in Jesus' name. Look at what other people like us, look at what they did, and look at how they did it. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 3, it says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they, you see these people, as we were ministering to the Lord, as we were doing the will of God, it says they did it to their power. And when it appears that they were totally exhausted, they didn't pack up and go back home, I cannot do more, that's all I can do. It says here, beyond their power, it says they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and then he goes on to say and take upon, uh, upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. Look at verse 5. And this they did, and this you will do. Not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves wholeheartedly, completely, without any reservation and without any hypocrisy. They gave themselves according to the will of God. I pray that that same mind will be in every one of us. That same heart will be in every one of us. How did it happen to them? They were saved. 
the salvation was genuine. That's how they were able to do the will of God wholeheartedly. They were sanctified and the sanctification was genuine, was real, was deep, affected their hearts, affected their mind, affected them completely. And so they were able to give themselves totally unto the Lord and to the service of the Lord by the will of God. Point number two now single-minded conformity to God's prevailing will single-minded conformity to God's prevailing will we're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 21 Acts chapter 21 I'm reading here from verse 10 Acts of the Apostles Chapter 21, reading from verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus, says the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, but we and they of that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem, when they heard persecution was waiting for him. When they heard opposition was waiting for him. When they heard steep resistance was waiting for him. In Jerusalem, and the people of that place and the companions of Paul the Apostle, they pleaded with him. They said, you cannot go. You must not go. Look at verse, 14, verse 13. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready. Somebody there, I am ready. Ready to do the will of God. I am ready. Ready to preach the gospel. I am ready. Ready to endure persecution. Are you ready? Say it out aloud. I am ready. Not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, because he had made up his mind. You know, if you didn't pick up your mind, if you were wavering yourself, and then all the people are saying, don't go, don't go, don't do it, don't fulfill the will of God. You say, well... I want to take to what my people are saying. I want to take to what my friends are saying. I want to take to what the brethren were saying. Because what, that you have not made up your mind. You need to really me to do the will of God. Let's say, for example, the will of God is restitution in a particular area of your life. And then your friends urge, and members of the church church and these people that are not steady, they are not steadfast in the word of God, they come to you and they say, we hear that you want to do this and do that. Yes, we understand restriction, but don't you know this one? This one is delicate. This one is terrible. It's okay because they've spoken to me. I don't think I want to do that again. You need to make up your mind. Let's say, for example, you want to evangelize because you have the conviction they're perishing and I must go out and reach out to them. And somebody comes to you and he says, don't you do over time your place of work? Do you have, is your salary enough? I'm not going to spend extra time on your work. Okay, I wanted to before, but you know, they're talking to me now. You didn't mean to serve the Lord before, but when you mean to serve the Lord, I'll say, this is what I am going to do. You do it in Jesus' name. Look at that. Look at verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, what did they say? We ceased saying, what did they say? The will of the Lord be done. 
He had made up his mind because he had a single minded commitment to God's prevailing will. They said, Let the will of God prevail. Let the will of God be done. As a true child of God, the will of God must prevail in your life. I said, The will of God must prevail in your life. That's our prayer, that's our expectation. That's our hope, that's our love, that's our delight, that's our joy to see the will of God prevail over man's will in our lives. To see the will of God prevail over Satan's will in our lives. Our desire, our joy, our mind is to see the will of God prevail over our own personal private will. It is to see the will of God prevail over any cherished will we want not see. A true child of God will rather fade away and be forgotten than see himself prevailing against God. Listen to that again. A true child of God, a bona fide child of God, a genuine child of God, a born again child of God, somebody who loves God with all his heart, all his soul, and all his mind. He would rather have himself fade away and would rather be forgotten than that he mortal man shall prevail against the almighty god he wants the will of god to prevail every time pharaoh may labor to see his own will prevail well he is pharaoh balak and balaam may conspire to have their will prevail what were they balaam a backslider joab and absalom may plot to have their own will prevail well, you know, Absalom and Nebuchadnezzar may kindle the fire so that he will contradict the will of God so that others will not do the will of God and he will impose his own will upon Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They may do that. They don't know God. Herod may kill to make the will of, to make his own personal will prevail but not so with a child of God. A child of God will not be like Balaam, will not be like Balak. You'll not be like Balaam. I said you'll not be like Balak. You'll not be like Pharaoh. You'll not be like Joab and Absalom. Ah, there's no amen from there. You'll not be like Nebuchadnezzar. You'll not be like Herod in Jesus' name. To see a real child of God knows that the greatest joy he has, the ultimate joy he has, the only joy he has, if he's a real child of God, is that God's will alone, God's might alone, God's power alone will prevail, even though his own personal will be perished. And so he prays, he says, God, let your will prevail. Let my will perish. And look at uh, chapter 20 of, uh, of Acts. Acts chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 24. Acts chapter 20 verse 24. It says, let me back up to verse 22. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save except that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying, the bonds and afflictions abide me. But 24, look at this. I pray this will be your experience. This will be your desire that the will of God will prevail. I said the will of God will prevail. Will prevail over your will. Will swallow up your will. And your own personal will will be no more. It says, but none of these things move me. Neither count I myself, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my cause with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I pray that will happen in our lives. Let me have a good, good amen. 
And now we're looking at uh, chapter 22. Look at the call of Paul the Apostle. And look at what he was told and what he learned from the very beginning that he was called, that he was converted, and came to know the Lord. The will of God must prevail. It's the prevailing will of God that shows that we're in the path of righteousness. We're on our way to heaven. We have left the world behind us and we're following after Christ who is going to take us to heaven. We're looking at um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 22. At chapter 22, I read from verse 14. It says, And he said, The God of thy, of the, of the, of our fathers has chosen thee. This is Ananias uh, talking, to, uh, talking to Paul the Apostle at the point of his conversion. It says that thou shouldest know his will. That thou shouldest know his will. And also see the just one. And should us hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what unto all unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Paul the apostle knew from the time of his conversion that the will of God was to be the prevailing sin in his life. I pray it will be like that in your life. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verse 9. The will of God prevailing. The might of God prevailing. And all the decisions of God, the purpose of God prevailing. Your own will gone. Your own will buried your own will swallowed up it tells us in colossians chapter 1 verse 9 for this cause we also since the day we heard it out of your conversion out of your turning to the lord do not cease to pray for you and to desire that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all in all wisdom and spiritual understanding it says we've been praying for you that you'll be filled with the knowledge of his will the understanding of his will the desire of his will i pray that will happen in your life ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 17 ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 17 it says wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not unwise, be not careless, but you must be understanding what the will of the Lord is. What does that will of the Lord come to? Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for each that ye might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word, that ye might present it to himself a glorious church. That's the will of God for the church to be glorious. Not having, not having spot, that's the will of God that the church should be spotless or wrinkled. That's the will of God that the church will not have wrinkles, the marks of the old man, or any such sin, but that it should be holy. That's the will of God that the church and the Christian should be holy and without blemish. That will of God will be fulfilled in your life. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 5. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. It says you have masters in your place of work. You have leaders in the church. Your parents at home be obedient unto them. And it says according, according to the flesh, humanly. And it says with fear, that means with reverence. That means with respect. That means with honor. And it says and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service, you see that. 
were to do the will of God, not with eye service, not with hypocrisy, not with pretense, and not just occasionally. It says, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing what are you doing? What are you supposed to be doing? What are you always to do? At home, what are you to do? At work, what are you to do? In the church, what are you to do? Doing the will of God from the heart. That means you are saying the will of God will prevail in your life will prevail in your home. The will of God will prevail in your character. The will of God will prevail in your behavior. The will of God will prevail in your Christian experience. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Amen. Jesus died for it is the will of God. Jesus provided for it is the will of God. Jesus wants you to be sanctified and to be one with him and one with the believers. He died for that. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Look at verse 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Amen. Let's make that personal. For God has not called me unto uncleanness. You are going to repeat that. For God has not called me unto uncleanness. But unto holiness. That's the calling. You will fulfill it. I will fulfill it. We shall fulfill it together in Jesus' name. The will of God. The will of God. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 36. Hebrews chapter 10. Reading from verse 36. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36. It says, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God. Don't be impatient. I've done the will of God now. Why didn't I have that? Why didn't I receive that? Why didn't I get this? I want this. I want that. You don't want uh, God to just uh, be chipping things over to you. Uh, because, uh, you know, just to fulfill your will, you want to wait for God. It says we have need of patience, perseverance. That after we have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Our Lord is coming again. I said, Our Lord is coming again. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back. I am not of them who draw back unto perdition. But I'm of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 15 and verse 16. First Peter chapter 2, verse 15. For so is the will of God. That with well doing, ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's saying that we as children of God, there will be people that will do foolish things, things they shouldn't have done. Then you don't react like them or react to them and do like they have done. That you must stay in the center, at the center of the will of God. Because this is the will of God, that through your goodness and through your character, through your good behavior, through your Christ-likeness, you'll put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. God will help you. Chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, reading here from verse 16. It says, having a good conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, 
they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Look at verse 17. For it is better if it be the will of God, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. When you have done good, when you have done right, when you are following Christ, when you are obedient to Christ, and then you suffer for that, because there are some people who do not understand, you are walking the will of God, you are doing the will of God. They are saying that, you know, you are just doing that, you are just doing that. They don't understand the will of God. And if they oppress you, persecute you, and you suffer because of that, you rejoice because that is the will of God. You will abide in the will of God. For Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. We're coming to chapter 4, First Peter, chapter 4, I read from verse 1. It says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves, equip yourselves, put on like an armor, likewise the same mind. For he that has suffered uh, in the flesh has ceased from sin. You stop sinning. At home, stop sinning. On the street, stop sinning. In the bus, stop sinning. Anywhere you are, you cease from sin. Look at verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Amen. You will live by the will of God. Why do we live by the will of God? Because only those who are living by the will of God will abide forever and ever with the Lord. In First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. First John chapter 2 verse 15. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Any man, any man, any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and then it goes on to say, and uh, the pride of life, and uh, the lust of the eyes is not of the Father, but of the world. Look at this, verse 17. But the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth what? He that doeth what? If that is you, let me hear your voice. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You will not want the will, your own personal will, your own private will, your own human will to prevail against the word of God. If you're a real child of God, you are single-mindedly committed to God's prevailing will. Point number three now, swift signal condemnation for God's permissive will. Swift condemnation, strong condemnation, singular condemnation, specific condemnation, signal condemnation for God's permissive will. What does that mean? There are some people they say, well, that perfect will of God is too much for me. The only will that counts is the perfect will of God. When you are not willing to do the perfect will of God, and then you say, Lord, tell me another thing. Whatever the Lord tells you then, that permissive will of God actually comes because that person is abandoned by the Lord. Let's come to Numbers. Numbers chapter 22. In Numbers chapter 22, we're reading from verse 12. Numbers chapter 22. Reading from verse 12, it says, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. That's the perfect will of God. 
Stay where you are. Balaam, that's the perfect will of God. Don't go out to follow those people. That's the perfect will of God. Don't go with them to Balak. That's the perfect will of God. Don't curse the children of Israel because they are blessed. That's the perfect will of God. And so he told the people, the Lord refuses for me to go with you. I want to stay in the will of God. Look at verse 15. And Balak said yet again, princes, more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said unto him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, not even God, let nothing, not even the will of God, let nothing, not the voice of God, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, cause me this people. Verse 18, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold money, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what God will say unto me more. Does God change? I said, does God change? The man wanted money. He wanted what Balak was promising. Look at verse 20. And God came unto Balaam at night. And said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that thou shalt do. What God said first, don't go. Don't go to Balak. Don't curse the people because they are blessed. That's the perfect will of God. This one now, that Balaam went back to God and said, I will check up. Maybe he has changed his mind. I'll check up. Maybe he wants me to go now. And God said, okay, you can go. That one is the permissive will of God. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because, tell me, and God's anger was kindled because, say it aloud, because he went, permissive will draws the anger of God. Permissive will draws the judgment of God. And permissive will will not get anybody to heaven. And it says, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary, for an enemy against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his, and, the, and his two servants were with him. Unfortunate for those servants, following somebody, going with somebody, who is only following the, the permissive will of God. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way. And went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on one side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself onto the wall. And crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote the ass again, smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went farther and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's 
anger was kindled and he smote the ass with, the, with his staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And, the, and Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I have killed thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not an ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since? And he says, Ever since I was thine unto this day, was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw, what did he see? The angel of the Lord standing in the way, and he saw drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore, as thou smitten thine ass these uh, three times, Behold, I went out to withstand thee. Was following the permissive will of God. Permissive will of God will destroy the backslider. Permissive will of God will destroy whoever is perpetrating that will and saying, I have the word of God, I had a dream, I had a vision. Because, you know, at first I read the Bible and the Bible says, don't go, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But I prayed, I fasted, and then God showed me in a dream and said, now you can do it. That's permissive will of God. It will destroy you. And so the angel said, I went out to withstand thee. It says, because thy way is perverse before me. And they have saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I have slain thee and saved her the ass alive. Look at Balaam. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, tell me, tell me. I have seen, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, now therefore, I'm waiting for you. Now therefore, if it displeased thee, did it displease the angel? Of course. Didn't the angel said, your way is perverse before me? Didn't the angel said, say, were it not that the ass turned, I would have killed you. You're a backslider. You're a sinner. And he was still saying, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. That's what you should have done. He should have said, since he said, I have sinned. I have sinned. I'm sorry. He should have turned back. I will do that no more. But you see, there are some backsliders, even though they are saying, I have sinned, I've gone astray, I shouldn't have done that. They keep on doing that same. They said they have confessed, and they said they have sinned. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, okay, go with the men. Is that the perfect will of God? Go with the men. What kind of will is that? That's permissive will, permissive will. But look at, look at this, look at the New Testament interpretation of that. We're looking at 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 2, what are you reading here from verse 15? It says, which have, which have forsaken the right way. And I've gone astray following the way of Balaam. They forsaking the right way, permissive will of God. They forsaking the perfect way, the permissive will of God. And it says, they said, this Balaam, the son of Bosom, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb are speaking. With man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. 
and there are clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom it is reserved to whom the mist of darkness is reserved how long how long forever those who are in the permissive will of god eh, god told me the dream god showed me this god showed me that i have the voice of god if it is different from the word of god that's permissive will and it will lead the person to hell fire eternally is following the way of cain it's following the way of Korah. It's following the way of Balaam. We're coming to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. I read from verse 11. Jude chapter 1 verse 11. Woe unto them. They have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for reward. They want reward. They want recognition. They want money. They want silver and gold. They want foreign currency. They're looking for something. The thing that gain is godliness. They go in the way of Balaam. And so they see the will of God, the perfect will of God. They will not deal. They abandon that will of God, perfect will of God, and they go for the permissive will of God. And it says in verse 12, These are sports in your fields of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruits wither it, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Look at this, raging, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for how long? Forever. Permissive will of God is dangerous. Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 6. In Ezekiel chapter 14, reading from verse 6, it says, Therefore say unto the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abomination. Look at verse 7. For every one of the house of Israel and of the stranger that sojourneth in, the, in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart, and put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. He has idol in the heart. Money is the idol. A particular thing is the idol. Position is the idol. His own personal will is the idol. And that uh, thing that he has in mind is his idol. Whatever the word of God says, which reveals the perfect will of God, uh -uh, he will not do that. And then he comes to God, he comes to the prophet. Look at verse 8. And I will set my face against that man, and I will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And he shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived, those who are prophesying for people, they see visions for people, they abandon the word of God, they leave the word of God, which is the perfect will of God, and they're looking for dream and vision and all that. If that prophet be deceived, when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel, and they shall bear the punishment of the iniquity. The punishment of the prophet, 
shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. This punishment, when somebody has abandoned the perfect will of God and now is following after, after dream, after revelation, after the permissive will of God. Jeremiah chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 12. Jeremiah 18, verse 12. It says in verse 12, And they said, There is no hope. But we will walk after our own devices, our own personal will. We made up our minds. That's what you're going to do. There is no hope, but we will walk after, the, after our own devices. Look at this. We will everyone do the imagination of, tell me, Ah, I've lost my crowd. It says, everyone we will do according to the imagination of his evil heart. They knew their hearts were evil. They knew they were backsliding. Like Balaam, I have sinned. They knew they were not following the perfect will of God. But they said all the same. We're not saved. We're backsliding. We're not sanctified. We're carnal. We're fleshly, but we will do after the imagination of our evil heart. You see, that's the people who want to prevail against God. And they want the will of God to be subservient unto them, to be subjected unto them. They want only their own will to be the one that will prevail. I pray you'll not be like that. I say you'll not be like that. All right, I will not be like that. Look at some seven, some eight one, some eight one. I'm reading from verse eleven. Some eight one, verse eleven. Look at this. Some eight one, verse eleven. For my people will not hack in to my voice. They don't want the perfect will of God. They want religion. They want tradition. They want their own will. They want to come together. They want an assembly. They want church. They want denomination. But they want to come with their will. They, want, they don't want their will to be broken. And they don't want to follow after the perfect will of God. That will take conversion. They don't want to be converted. That will take sanctification. They don't want to be sanctified. It says, but my people will not hack into my voice. And Israel would none of me. So I gave them up. He said, they didn't want the perfect will of God, so I gave them up to their own hearts lost. And they walked in their own counsels. That's what they wanted. And God abandoned them. If you follow after the permissive will, the Lord will abandon you. I pray he will not abandon you. I pray you'll not follow after the permissive will. We're coming to Psalm 106, and I'm reading from verse 13. Psalm 106, reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, it says, They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. They're too much in a hurry. I want to do it now. I want to go there now. I want to have it now. I want to possess it now. I want to pursue it now. This praying and praying and praying and this reading the Bible, studying the Bible and this finding the perfect will of God is taking time. I want each now. Look at this, verse 13. It says, They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but they lost it exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Look at verse 15. Let's read verse 15 together. One, two, three, go. You see, he gave them material things, but he lost in the spiritual. He gave them their request, but he sent leanness unto their soul. I pray that will not happen to you. Because there's punishment for the people that will abandon the will of God and then they follow after 
permissive will. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, I'm looking at chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even, he said, he's talking about at the time of the Antichrist, but the spirit of the Antichrist in the world already. He said, even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The people, they know there's false doctrine somewhere, but they say, well, I'm looking for a child. I'm looking for healing. I'm looking for deliverance. I'm looking for miracle. It says even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. I pray you will not perish. I will not perish. I said, I will not perish. But he says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love for the truth. The truth, that's the perfect will of God. They received not the love for the truth. It says that they might be saved. And for that cause, look at this, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Permissive will. God will send them strong delusion. They will actually believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. You will not have pleasure in unrighteousness. You will not have delight in unrighteousness. You will not be carrying unrighteousness about in Jesus' name. Look at what happens. Romans chapter 1 verse 28. Romans chapter 1 verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, perfect will of God was strength to them. They didn't like that. They didn't want that. They didn't appreciate that. They will not embrace that. It says, even as they will not, uh, they, will, they did not like God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God gave them up. You want to go that way? All right. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You want to ask yourself today, what kind of will are you following? Are you following God's permissive will? Are you following God's perfect will? Perfect will I will follow. God's perfect will I will follow. Say that aloud. God's perfect will I will follow. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. You'll do the will of God. You need salvation to do it, he'll give it to you. You need sanctification to do it, he'll give it to you. You need total abandonment of your own personal will and lay it on the altar, nail it on the altar and say, Lord, I will do your will. That's the only thing that gets us to heaven. You'll do it in Jesus' name. Verse 9, then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Can you say that with me? Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Can you say that again? Rise right, so up and tell the Lord, I want to do your will. Permissive will, be gone. Selfish will, be gone. Personal will, be gone. Perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, Lo, I come. To do thy will, O oh God.